So it would be fair to say that you weren't sure. I was positive that I was positive it was you. Who is you? You. I'm looking at you. A secret video catching a killer in a lie, an actress admitting to being violent on an audio tape, and eyewitnesses picking out a murderer in court. These are some bombshell pieces of evidence or smoking guns in recent trials. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Trials are a battle. They're a battle between the prosecution and the defense. Evidence back and forth showing a defendant is guilty or not guilty, liable or not liable. And many times it's the totality of the evidence, the collection of it as a whole that matters, these building blocks of a case. But there are times when that one piece of evidence comes out that can arguably win the whole case or destroy the whole case. In the law, we call this the smoking gun, and we have sure seen some examples of that in recent trials. Those pieces of evidence that have changed everything for a defendant. So, here is our list of the top six smoking guns from recent trials. First up, we might as well start with the big one. It is the kennel video in the Alec Murdoch trial. Now, this was a very high-profile trial, so many people following it. Alec Murdoch, the disgraced South Carolina attorney on trial for the murders of his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul. The prosecution argued that he shot his family to death to distract away from or cover up his financial crimes of stealing from his law firm and clients, and he did it as a way to buy himself time. That's what the prosecution argued. Now, the defense argued that there was a serious lack of evidence against him, that there was no forensic material on him, suggesting that he was the shooter, that the murder weapons hadn't been recovered, that Maggie and Paul were shot with two different weapons, so it really wouldn't have made sense for him to have done it all. That he had an alibi, that he wasn't at the dog kennels on the family property where the two were killed. That instead he was visiting his mother that night and only discovered their bodies when he came back to the house. In fact, Alec Murdoch repeatedly told law enforcement he wasn't at the kennels. What did you do once, once Maggie and Paul left? I stayed in the house. Okay. And... I was watching TV, looking at my phone, and I actually fell asleep on the couch. And you didn't go back down there after dinner until you returned trip from visiting your mother? Yes, sir. Okay, makes sense. He says he wasn't there. But during his trial, prosecutors presented the jury with a bombshell piece of evidence. A video that was recorded on the phone of Paul Murdoch. It was from 8.44 p.m. on the night of the murders, which was less than five minutes before prosecutors say Paul and Maggie were shot to death. And in this video, you will hear Paul at the dog kennel. You will also hear the voice of his mother. And guess who else you will hear? Get back. Get back. Quit, Cash. Come on. Quit. That's okay. Come here. Come here, Come here, Cash. Come on. Post it. Cash. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth. Bubba. Hey, Bubba. That's a guinea. This is a chicken. Come here, Bubba. Come here, Cash. Come here, Bubba. Cash. Quit. Did you hear that? That was the voice of Alec Murdoch. So he was, in fact, at the crime scene right around the time of the murders. And if you don't believe me, multiple witnesses who know the Murdochs well said that that was his voice. That was it. And by the way, it wasn't just them saying it. Alec Murdoch admitted himself that that was his voice. Mr. Murdoch, is that you? On the kennel video at 8.44 p.m. on June 7th. The night Maddie, Maggie and Paul were murdered. It is. Were you, in fact, at the kennels at 8.44 p.m. on the night Maggie and Paul were murdered? I was. Did you lie to Sled Agent Owen and Deputy Laura Rutland on the night of June 7th and told them that you stayed at the house after dinner? I did lie to them. As my addiction 
evolved over time. I would get in these situations or circumstances where I would get paranoid thinking. He may have admitted that he lied and claimed his drug addiction caused him to make bad choices like lying to law enforcement. But in the end, you have to think he had no choice but to own up to being at that crime scene because of that video. There was really nowhere for him to go. And arguably, that kennel video was the smoking gun, the linchpin that helped prosecutors secure a conviction against Alec Murdoch because he was found guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. All right, next up, let's stick with high-profile cases and move on to the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. So this was the case of the then 17-year-old who, back on August 25th, 2020, fired his AR-15 rifle during the Kenosha protests in Wisconsin. This was a night of civil unrest following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. So Rittenhouse ended up shooting three people, killing two of them, 36-year-old Joseph Rosenbaum and 26-year-old Anthony Huber. But Rittenhouse also shot and injured 26-year-old Gage Grosskreutz. Rittenhouse was charged with five crimes, first-degree intentional homicide, first-degree reckless homicide, first-degree attempted intentional homicide, and two counts of first-degree reckless endangerment. Very serious charges here. And prosecutors painted a picture of a young vigilante that he was armed, he was ready to cause trouble. Rittenhouse claimed that that wasn't the fact, that he was merely there to maintain order, order on a night of civil unrest. He was there to act as a medic, and he argued that he acted in self-defense with respect to all three shootings, that he felt he was going to die, that he was being chased, that he was being threatened, and that he was being attacked. So, Gage Grosskreutz, the only surviving victim of this, takes the stand, okay? And while he portrays himself as being the victim, and he says that Kyle Rittenhouse was armed, and he tried to kill him, and he was shot in the bicep, listen to what happened under cross-examination and what he admitted. Your original statement then to the police was, I tried telling the guy to stop hitting him with the skateboard. The guy on the ground then turned over, racked the weapon, and pointed his gun at me and shot me, right? That is correct, yes. Um, you omitted the idea, you omitted the fact that you ran up on him and had a Glock pistol in your hand, right? You left that out. Correct. After the defendant had shot me, I had just gotten out of surgery when the Kenosha police officers had arrived and just gone through one of the most traumatic experiences in my life, both emotionally and physically. I'd just gotten out of surgery. I had just been sedated. I was on pain meds. So, Go ahead, I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt you. Sorry. Um, it wouldn't have been a purposeful uh, omission. And you understand it's the only information that you appear to have forgotten that puts you with a gun directly in front of him, right? That is correct. At this point, you're holding a loaded, chambered Glock 27 in your right hand, yes? That is correct, yes. You are advancing on Mr. Rittenhouse, who is seated on his butt, right? That is correct. That's a photo of you, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, That's Mr. Rittenhouse? Correct. Okay. Now... Do you agree your firearm is pointed at Mr. Rittenhouse, correct? Yes. Okay. And once your firearm is pointed at Mr. Rittenhouse, that's when he fires his gun. Yes? No. <laughs> Sir, look, I don't want to... Does this look like right now your arm is being shot? That looks like my bicep being vaporized, yes. Okay. And it's being vaporized as you're pointing your gun directly at him. Yes? Yes. Okay, so when you were standing three to five feet from him with your arms up in the air, he never fired, right? Correct. It wasn't until you pointed your gun at him, advanced on him with your gun, now your hands down, pointed at him, that he fired, right? With Wisconsin, Let's go to Waukesha, Wisconsin. 
And now let's talk about the Darrell Brooks trial, which we covered extensively here on Sidebar. This was the case about the man charged with 76 criminal counts for driving a red SUV into a group of holiday parade goers back in November of 2021, killing six people, injuring dozens of others. It was a wild trial where the defendant chose to represent himself. He made a mockery of the courtroom. There were outbursts. He was kicked out of the court. He took his shirt off at one point. He yelled at the judge. He even frightened her. Criminal trespass to dwelling from 2006. All right, I need to take a break. This man right now is having a stare down with me. It's very disrespectful. He pounded his fist. Frankly, it makes me scared. But on to the central question. Was Darrell Brooks driving that SUV that ran into those spectators? You want to talk about a smoking gun? How about eyewitnesses that pointed him out? I saw directly through the driver's window. What did you see? I saw a man focused on the group ahead of him. Is that Daryl Brooks that you saw? Yes. Mr. Brooks, uh, please remove your mask. Thank you. Officer Schneider, is the driver of the red SUV that you've just described for this jury present in this courtroom today? Objection, yes. hearsay. Can you please point him out by where he's seated and what he's wearing? He is seated over here at the table wearing a gray suit. That's the man you saw driving the red SUV as it sped past you? Yes, it is. Do you know for sure if the driver of the vehicle you observed was in fact angry? I assume that he was. So it would be fair to say you don't know for sure? I do not know for sure, but that is my opinion, is that he was angry. And at that time, you had no knowledge who the driver was. Would that be fair to say? Well, I had knowledge because I saw your face. Also, it sure didn't help that a close-up photograph of Darrell Brooks behind the wheel of the car was taken as well. Yeah, that's never great. Eyewitnesses, photographic proof, that's bad. You want to guess what happened? He was convicted of every charge and sentenced to six life sentences plus over 700 additional years. As we talk about smoking guns, those key pieces of evidence that basically won a case for a side, we got to talk about some celebrity trials. And I want to start with Gwyneth Paltrow. The actress and entrepreneur was sued by a retired eye doctor named Terry Sanderson. Sanderson argued that back in 2016, while the two were both skiing at Deer Valley Resort in Utah, Paltrow negligently slammed into him from behind, severely injuring him. He claimed he suffered broken ribs, a brain injury, that his life has really never been the same. He sued for over $300,000. Paltrow not only defended herself from this, but actually filed a countersuit, a counterclaim, for $1 and her attorney's fees. Her argument was that Sanderson hit into her from behind, that she was the victim. This was literally the complete opposite story of Sanderson's account, and it really came down to negligence. Did someone fail to act as a reasonable skier would under the circumstances and therefore was at fault for what happened? Now, Terry Sanderson took the stand, and he went through how he was hit, how his life fell apart because of his injuries. He's been a shell of a man since the crash. Okay. But in arguably one of the worst pieces of evidence for him, Paltrow's side hit him with some really damning pictures. Post-incident travel by Dr. Sanderson, Mr. Sanderson. Did you go to Peru? Yes. After the collision. All of these are after the collision, okay? Yes. Visit Machu Picchu? Costa Rica, yes. Walk the Golden Trail? Yes. Machu Picchu is in Peru. Uh, yes. Floated down the Amazon? Uh, yes, I guess so. Costa Rica. Did you do a zip line? Same trip, yes. Did you go to Europe? Visit Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, France, Belgium? With my daughter, Jenny, yes. Bottom half, James, please. Did you go to the Netherlands three times? I don't remember. Well, if you're disputing it, then we pull it out of your out of your deposition. I don't remember. I have no reason to dispute it or agree. Okay, Morocco twice. True. Uh, 
Likely, very likely. Canary Islands, I need to know if you're disputing these things. I can't dispute it, no. Thailand, did you go to Thailand after the collision? Yes. Did you visit at least the states of Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho after the collision? Probably, yes. You're a Facebooker, right? At least you were at the time. You posted um, a lot on social media. It, it, relative to other people, it didn't seem like I did. Very little. All of these pictures are from your, your personal Facebook after the collision. Okay. Does this seem like the guy that Sanderson and his team portrayed? Or does this fall into what Paltrow's team argued? That Sanderson is not telling the truth. That he over-exaggerated his injuries. And maybe whatever changes to his personality or deficits he had was the result of him getting older and not from anything Paltrow did to him. And you know what? The jury agreed. They didn't believe Sanderson. In fact, it only took them a few hours to come back with a unanimous verdict. They determined he was 100% at fault for what happened that day, and Paltrow won her case and cleared her name. In fact, after the trial, a juror spoke with ABC News and said, quote, you know, I wouldn't have thought he was capable of those things based on the picture he painted. Okay, let's stick with high-profile celebrity trials and move on to Alex Jones. How could I talk about a defendant's case blowing up without talking about Alex Jones? So the InfoWars founder and host was in a very tricky situation. He was sued by the families of those who lost loved ones in the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, as well as a former FBI agent for comments that he made regarding that massacre, namely when he said that it was staged and fake and a hoax. He did that on his program. Now, they sued him under various legal theories, such as defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress. And Alex Jones actually automatically lost those lawsuits because he failed to abide by court-ordered discovery obligations. The trials we covered on law and crime and we talked about on sidebar were purely about how much would he have to owe the plaintiffs in damages. Not that he's liable, but how much would he have to owe. So he's going into these two trials as a loser, and it just becomes a matter of how much he has to pay. Now, his defense was he realized he made a mistake. He tried to correct the record, that the plaintiffs were overstating their damages, and that his company, which was also sued, doesn't have a lot of money left. And Jones decided to explain a lot of this when he took the stand. But focusing on his first trial in Texas, there was one moment that you could say changed everything for Alex Jones. You see, Mr. Jones, while under oath, he said he couldn't find any text messages from him talking about Sandy Hook. But when cross-examined by plaintiff's attorney Mark Bankston, he was presented with evidence to the contrary. And then he was hit with this bombshell. Do you know where I got this? No. Mr. Jones, did you know that 12 days ago, 12 days ago, your attorneys messed up and sent me an entire digital copy of your entire cell phone with every text message you've sent for the past two years, and when informed, did not take any steps to identify it as privileged or protect it in any way. And as of two days ago, it fell free and clear into my possession. And that is how I know you lied to me when you said you didn't have text messages about Sandy Hook. Did you know that? I See, I told you the truth. This is your Perry Mason moment. I gave them my phone and then- Mr. Jones, you need to answer the question. No, I, Do you know I, I, this happened? No, I didn't know this happened, but I mean, I told you, I gave him the phone over. Just, just and you the said, question. you said in your deposition, you searched your phone. You said you pulled down the text, did the search function for Sandy Hook. That's what you said, Mr. Jones, correct? And I had several, several different phones with this number, but I did, yeah. Well, of course, I mean, that's why you got it. No, Mr. Jones, that's not why I have it. My lawyer sent it to you, but I'm hiding it. Okay. Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, please that? just answer questions. There's no question. Mr. Bankston uh -huh. also only asked questions. Sure. Mr. Jones, in discovery, you were asked, do you have Sandy Hook text messages on your phone? And you said no, correct? You said that under oath, Mr. Jones, didn't you? I mean, I was mistaken. I was mistaken, but you, you got the messages right there. You know what perjury is, right? I just want to make sure you know before we go any further. You know what it is. Yes, I do. I mean, I'm not a tech guy. I told you I gave, in my testimony, the phone to the lawyers before or whatever, and, and so you got my phone, but we didn't give it to you. No, Mr. Jones. One more time. 
Um, please remember, if you need to assert the Fifth Amendment, you can. I need to know that you can do that. But you testified under oath previously that you personally searched your phone for the phrase Sandy Hook and there were no messages. You said that under oath. Yes. And you lied when you said it. No, I did not lie. So that was really bad. That's basically being caught red-handed, right? If you aren't being truthful about that, what are you being truthful about? And in the end, the jury came back with a massive damages award against Jones for almost $50 million, and it really only got worse for him because in his second trial out in Connecticut, the jury there awarded the plaintiffs almost $1 billion, and the judge ordered an additional $473 million in additional punitive damages. Let's close this out with arguably one of the biggest trials in the past few years, maybe even in the last 10 years, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. The Pirates of the Caribbean star sued his ex-wife for defamation over a Washington Post op-ed piece that she authored in which she claimed she was the victim of domestic abuse, implying at the hands of Johnny Depp. Now, Heard ended up countersuing Johnny Depp for comments that his attorney made, presumably on his behalf, calling Heard's claims a hoax. This was an ugly case, a really, really ugly case. Heard took the stand. She would get highly emotional, recounting the disturbing accounts where she was sexually, verbally, physically abused by Depp. Depp would get on the stand. He would say, no, 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 that he was the victim, that Heard attacked him. So it was a question of who do you believe? Well, there is one thing for Depp and Heard to testify in 2022 about what happened in the past and for jurors to weigh their credibility And then there is something entirely different about hearing something in real time. And that is one of the most damning pieces of evidence in this case, arguably the smoking gun. And I am referring to the infamous audio recordings. You see, the couple would actually tape their fights. And although at times Johnny Depp said he didn't know it was happening, it was important. And in possibly a very candid moment, listen to what Amber Heard said. No, it's it's not to get you mad it's not to get, it's just to get out of a bad situation while it's happening before it gets worse in australia when we had the big fight where i lost the tip of my finger at least five bathrooms and two bedrooms i went to 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 avoid talking to me to, to avoid escape the, out. That's to the escape problem. the fight you don't escape the fight. You escape the solution. No. You escape the solution. No. You s- escape figuring it out. We cannot work it out if you run away to the bathroom every time. I said to Travis, I said, Good. no, I said to you, hey, okay. tell Travis right. what just happened. You oh, you told me it. to do it. You yeah. told me to. You said, go do that. I said, no, t- tell him what just happened. And I lied. And that you punched me in the yeah. thing. And you you figured it out. And you said, no, f- no, I didn't. What the f- are you talking about? And I, I didn't watched you lie. And then I, I didn't s- punch you, by the way. You, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, you, uh, uh, hit you across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You, you know, you've been a lot of fights. You've been around a long time. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, when you I, have a close You face. didn't get punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this, but I did not punch you. I did not deck you. I was hitting you. I don't know what the motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. How are you? How, what am I supposed to do? Do this? I, I'm not sitting here bitching about it, am I? You are. Oh, That's the difference between me and you. You're a baby. Because you start. You are such a baby. Grow the f- up, Johnny. physical fights. I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did, so I had because, to get out of there. Yes, you did. So you did the right thing, the big thing. The, you know what? You are admirable. That was really powerful. You have heard on tape admitting that she hit Johnny Depp. And not only that, but that Depp didn't necessarily fight back but ran away. Well, you have to imagine that really hurt Amber Heard because the jury found her liable for defamation for each of the three statements in that op-ed piece Although they did find Depp liable to Heard with respect to one statement from his lawyer, but she really lost this case when you think about it. The jury awarded Depp $10 million in compensatory damages, $5 million in punitives, and awarded Heard only $2 million. Smoking gun, that's what that was. And smoking guns, they can literally change the course of a case. 
We'll be on the lookout for future bombshell pieces of testimony and evidence as we continue to cover major trials across the country. That's all we have for you here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time. Thank you.